I met with Scotty for the first time at Hamcation in Orlando uh, a few months ago, and uh, he mentioned about using this opportunity to, uh, to honor Bob for me, and I thought, what a great idea. So, uh, and we we'll work together to get the banquet back on, uh, in motion, and so this evening we're going to have several speakers. Yes, oh, there he is right there. Uh, so we're going to have several speakers uh, tonight. We've got, uh, first up, is uh, our friend Bob is going to come up and speak, and then uh, Frank Bauer, and then we're going to open the floor to allow anyone to come up and uh, share some remembrances of Bob Bernini. I just want to say thank you for uh, organizing this, and uh, look forward to seeing how it goes. So, we'll uh, see where it goes from here. Okay, so, uh, Bob, are you ready? All right. Good evening, I'm Bob, and 4 hy So, uh, for years, I've been in AMSAT, Bob Reninga was in AMSAT, and I worked with Bob a few times and had some interesting interactions with him. I worked on a spacecraft with Rick Hambly at the uh, Navy Lab, uh, Naval Academy, and Bob Reninga was there. Many of you know that Bob Reninga built a bunch of spacecraft and sent them up to orbit, and we, we might know about them five minutes before they went to orbit. Uh, but Bob had one particular spacecraft which I'm going to tell you about. Bob bought cheap crap to build spacecraft. <laughs> he bought the worst Hamtronics crap you can possibly imagine. And he glued it all together, and if it worked in this lab for five minutes, that was adequate testing. <laughs> so Bob put these Hamtronics modules in a frigging cake pan screwed them into the cake pan. He actually got them on a progress and sent it to the International Space Station. <laughs> and it worked like a champ until they decided to turn it off. Yeah. Why might they turn it off, you say? So it's sitting on the outside of the International Space Station, harmonics and other trash bleeding all over the place, and the progress module comes in and gets close to Bob's spacecraft, and suddenly, they can't command it. <laughs> oh my goodness, what is this crap interfering with the progress module? Bob was nowhere to be found. They send the police to find him. <laughs> and he tells them how to turn his Hamtronics pie pan crap off and the progress docks. That, my friends, is Bob Bruninga. So Bob had a Prius, and it was a neat little vehicle, until he totally hacked it from beginning to end. Solar panels everywhere, 100-foot telescoping mast. This thing was right out of a science fiction movie. And he was a fanatic about DC power grids and ground returns and why we should be doing that everywhere. And of course, he was right. And it's now being done all over the place. But of course, Bob is best known for his tyrannical control of APRS. And uh, he, uh, I don't, I have no idea who's going to take over. I don't know if Steve Dempsey's going to do it. I doubt he will. But now that Bob is gone, APR probably will have some, but look, APRS did a bunch of great stuff. I mean, I pop, pop it onto my car and you can follow me all across the country and it works like a champ. Bob kept it simple. He added a few messages, especially when he wanted to put them in spacecraft, and you'd be able to have things come through the spacecraft. Uh, and he, APRS was the thing. He got ro regular royalties from Kenwood in every radio that contained APRS, and he just did a great thing. If we remember Bob for nothing else other than the interesting Asperger syndrome person he was, we have got to remember him for APRS. Uh, we will miss Bob because he was very entertaining. He was interesting to talk to, and he would always leave you puzzled 
until you figure out exactly what he was talking about, and then it, it would go on. I wish I knew a lot more personal things about Bob, but I figured these anecdotes probably nobody else but me would tell them. So anyway, that's it for me. I'm Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, and I'm uh, the executive director of ERIS, uh, the ERIS program. Let me first say that uh, the ERIS International team really mourns the loss of uh, Bob Reninga, WB4APR. He's a genius who pioneered digital amateur radio techniques, invented the APRS digital signal protocol, and designed innovative, the innovative uh, ERIS Kenwood radio crew interface. Bob's passing on uh, February 7th of this year was a huge blow to our human space flight image radio team. Uh, Bob's brilliance, um, which you can look at it in a couple different ways, um, it basically permeated all through the image radio community, primarily because of his invention of APRS. Um, and in his own words, Bob described APR, his APRS vision as a two-way tactical real-time digital communication system between all assets in a network sharing information about everything going on in the local area. <coughs> Did you f catch all of that? <laughs> That's Bob. <laughs> um, so I lived in, I live in the Washington DC area. I was fortunate enough to, uh, I was an active, I still am an active AMSAT member and uh, Goddard Amateur Radio Club member. And so I was fortunate enough to, to, to call Bob, a, a friend and colleague. Bob's creativity, uh, genius, passion, um, I, I worked with him from the middle 1980s until he, his passing. Whether it was packet radio communications, the Naval Academy shipmen, uh, education and mentoring that he talked about all the time, or solar electric cars and, and, and houses, Bob's infectious enthusiasm was ever present. In the early days of APRS, um, I used to listen intently when Bob would come by the radio club and gleefully talk about his use of APRS in real time to track the uh, midshipman's 230 mile trek uh, of the football from the US Naval Academy to the, uh, to the uh, Army Navy football game. He'd be pulling out his graphs, and, you know, his, his papers, trying to show me all what was going on, and a little later, computer uh, program showing all what was going on. It was really cool to, to see this and, and to watch the folks trek up uh, the East Coast for the, uh, Naval, uh, the Army Navy game. But, but I want to focus on uh, human spaceflight for a little bit here. Bob's contribution and creativity to human spaceflight really started uh, almost 40 years ago in uh, 1985, in early 1985, when um, astronaut Ron Priest was originally planned to fly in um, March of 1986, right before the uh, Challenger accident, which of course got delayed. But uh, Bob uh, was working with an AMSAT team and a Tapper team uh, to work with us on rapid message protocols uh, for what we call the packet robot. Um, the packet robot ultimately would become a mainstay um, use on the shuttle image radio experiment or our shuttle program of the day. And it allowed hams to conduct uh, rapid multi-QSOs, multiple QSOs at, you know, at the same time with the shuttle ham radio system autonomously while the shuttle crew was busy doing other things. In particular, Ron Priest was doing an astronomy mission. He wanted to do ham radio and uh, this gave him the opportunity to do that and part of the design of that included a meta beacon so that they could, the crew could actually type in little beacons and, and, and send them out uh, progress reports as they were going along. So um, we started this um, packet development efforts at uh, a pizza dive right near the Goddard Space Flight Center with uh, Tom Clark, K3IO, um, Bob, uh, Dick Daniels, W4PUJ, and myself on a weekly basis, getting together, Tom and Bob would be talking to all the different Tapper and, and AMSET folks coming up with ideas. And um, I, right before, well, it was actually after Tom's passing, um, I asked Bob about 
you know, the genesis of APRS and, and, and relative to the packet robot stuff, because I knew there was a definite connection there. And Bob basically told me that uh, the discussions helped him firm up his ideas on how APRS could be used not only as a positioning tool, but as a communications capability allowing rapid status and message reporting, thus allowing lots of people to rapidly make exchanges during the brief satellite pass. So as, as I said, this was a mainstay on SARX all the way through the, the rest of the, the uh, 23 missions uh, that we used it. Um, but besides the packet robot activities, um, one of my most memorable experiences with Bob um, was those of you that um, know, you know about the 12 meter dish at the Naval Academy? Some of you know that. They, there's a 12 meter dish at the Naval Academy. And um, on a few of our SARX flights, we were trying to do um, ATV uplinks. And the dish was a great opportunity to do that. So uh, Bob got you know, permission to use the dish, and we got all set up and everything. And so I was going to go over there one morning while we did a shuttle pass. Get over there, it's drizzling. I'd never been to the facility before, so I parked the car and I thought, well, you know, they're going to have me move this. And uh, Bob greets me at the door and he says, uh, I said, Bob, where should I park the car? He says, oh, just leave it where it is. I said, okay. So I go inside and we're working, you know, getting ready, getting ready for the pass. It's time to move the dish to the right position. All of a sudden, somebody said, hold it, wait. And they stop the dish. Bob and I walk outside. The top of my van, the dish was this far from the top of my van. <laughs> when the pass was over, you know, of course I moved my car. Um, when the pass was over, I said, I looked at Bob and I said, Bob, I don't know what my insurance company would say, and I don't know what the Naval Academy would say, but I sure am glad that didn't happen. So, um, in the early 2000s, when Eris was developing its second generation uh, radio system, Bob became the chief architect of the Eris Kenwood D700 radio program modes. Uh, our main objective was to make the crew interface very simple and easy to switch operations. So we do packet, you know, um, voice operations and things like that. Um, a number of individuals from AMSAT were involved in this. Um, basically, Bob distilled the requirements into a really nice interface that has five program modes that allow us to do school contacts, voice repeater, APRS, experimental operations, and backup comm. Because you remember, for those that don't know, we're backup comm to the International Space Station. So all of this capability was uh, built into the system with all the frequencies and uh, it became a really good system for our program. And then in 2015, um, we did it again with Bob. We had a face-to-face -face meeting at the Johnson Space Center. I think it's Bob's last time to go to the Johnson Space Center. Um, and yeah, Dave was there with us uh, amongst others. And um, we met with Bob and Kenwood, and we walked through the whole thing, and we developed an, an enhanced version of this system uh, through Bob's uh, help. And as you know, uh, those of you that know, we launched the uh, interoperable radio system in March of, uh, of uh, 2020, and it's the mainstay uh, a use of what we're using for all of our contacts with the schools, all of our APRS, all of our, um, our, our voice repeater activities. So anytime you've... Uh, um, you've used our radio system, and you can really thank Bob for that, because he did a great job. Uh, you know, getting the astronauts' time is really hard, and for, for this elegant system that was developed, to make it as easy for the crew and fast for the crew to, to change modes, it's been uh, uh, very helpful for the amateur radio community, for the schools, and for the astronauts. Uh, so we can thank Bob for, the, for his brilliance in that. And the other thing I wanted, wanted to announce is that if everything goes well, next week, our second radio will be put on Space Station. And I promised the Tapper community many years ago, 1999, no, 1997, that we would have APRS and we would have Packet on, on uh, Space Station, which we did. 
Um, and those of you that have known recently, because we have one radio, we operate voice repeater for a period of time and APRS. With the second radio, hopefully we can have this, both of them running at the same time so that Packet will be on all the time. So um, on behalf of the ARIS International team, I'd like to convey our heartfelt thanks, I mean heartfelt thoughts and prayers to Bob's wife, his family, his many friends around the world, and especially those at Tapper, AMSAT, Eris, and Kenwood. Bob, we thank you for your unquenching drive to innovate radio communications and your pioneering spirit that transformed your brilliant ideas from a dream to reality. Because of you, APRS signals <laughs> continuously serve as an amateur radio beacon of inspiration, hope, and peace throughout the infinite universe. Thank you. All right, Bob and Frank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to open the floor at this time. If anyone would like to share an anecdote or a story about Bob, uh, please do so at this time. Who's first? As in, come on up. Yeah, come on up. Yeah. Uh, here's a very quick thing. Yep. I could. Uh, uh, Bob uh, very generously assigned the APRS trademark to Tapper. So that trademark will be protected and will go forward in, in helping keep the uh, protocol going. I don't know how APRS development is going to continue going forward. I know there are a lot of people talking about it, but we're very much determined to make sure that it continues uh, to honor what he's done. Well, I didn't know Bob very well, but he was uh, usually a fixture at DCCs. And I remember one some years ago, this kind of builds on uh, Bob's story of, of uh, Bob Berninga's haywire mentality <laughs> and, and, and making something functional and useful out of parts and nothing. And, and uh, if you remember the Kenwood radio, the D700 mobile radio, well, Kenwood decided they were going to come out with the, I think it was called the RCD10, which was because all of the APRS and packet functionality was in the head of the radio. So they came out with a head of the radio that you could then plug onto one of their one or two of their other radios and make it into an APRS radio. Well, they decided to sell this as a separate accessory. It was pretty expensive and not very many people bought them. So then Kenwood decided they were going to cut the price to 100 bucks. Well, Bob saw that $100 price on this front end, this, and it had a screen and everything. So he bought. I don't know how many of them he bought. Well, I probably bought the local store all out of them. And he brings this contraption to DCC, and it's a DRCD710, and he had an HT and a battery and a GPS duct taped together. And this was Bob's portable packet terminal that he brought to show up at DCC. And I just want to mention this because the first thing I did is I called my local HRO in Phoenix, and I bought their last one of the D710s, and it was because of him. So, and I still have it too, so I'll make something out of it, some haywire thing that would make Bob proud. Thank you. Who's next? Come on up. Here comes Nick. Mr. Pugh, here you go. I don't think I'm telling any secrets. Bob didn't have a whole lot of uh, life of red tape. <laughs> so I'm visiting one day, and he's got all his uh, raised floor panels pulled out. And I said, Bob, what you doing? You're not on know. He says, I'm hiding the stuff I don't want the auditors to see. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nick, that's a tough one to follow, isn't it? Deep, dark, uh, top secret. I'm Keith Baker. For those of you that uh, don't know me, I mean, a lot of new faces here. I'm the past president to uh, walk uh, in his shoes. Well, actually, he's walking in my shoes. And we learned very quickly that being president of AMSA is a lot like herding cats. 
if you've ever done that. But anyway, I have an interesting story, uh, as near as I can remember it, about Bob. Uh, it was right here at one of the inventions where we were still at Hera, and uh, Bob was, as uh, Frank was saying, was always looking for something creative and a different way to do things. And uh, we got talking, and he said, you know, I'd really like to try running APRS through one of your satellites. And at that time, uh, Oscar 16 was our packet satellite that had kind of, as I remember, it had kind of an odd split up and down. But by that time, most uh, amateur radio operators that were doing packet satellites had moved on to the 9600 broad birds. And AO-16 was kind of orbiting by itself, not really being used. And so I said, you know, uh, again, Bob was thinking outside the box. I really like to try that and see if we can get APRS through one of the satellites. So I went back to the board and said, hey, you know, Bob wants to try running APRS uh, through AO-16. Well, some of the board members, I thought maybe we were, we were going to be killing the Pope and canceling Christmas uh, because at that time, you know, APRS, well, what's that, and that's not real name radio and that kind of stuff. But anyway, one of the things that we said was that from the very earliest days of amateur satellites, we always set aside one day a week for experimenters. It was the experimenter, I think it was one Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, it was one experimental day on Wednesday. And so finally we got everybody together and said, mm -hmm, okay, let's try it on Wednesday. So sure enough, they started running APRS through AO-16. And of course now then he went on to build his whole fleet of amateur satellites with the Naval Academy. So I kind of like to think that Hangvention was, as it has been in so many different ways, kind of a, a forum for a lot of our inside folks to get together and come up with some back of the napkin type ideas. But uh, it also was the fact that again it was Bob thinking outside the box. So sir, may you rest in peace. He certainly has done a heck of a lot for amateur radio. And a lot of it was done behind the scenes. You know, he, he didn't really uh, beat the drum too much, he just kind of plopped along and, and said, well, let's try this. So, anyway. Thank you. You bet. Over the floor. Come on up. Hi, I'm Nathaniel W2NAF. So I never got to um, really know Bob or interact with him a whole lot, but there's one time that I, the first time I met him, it was a really interesting experience, and it really stuck with me, it's very memorable. And so um, I really got my start in amateur radio through scouting. And so as a scout, and a scouter, uh, back when I was about 18 or so, um, I had the opportunity to go from my hometown in Bloomfield, New Jersey, down to the Naval Academy for one weekend where they, the midshipmen put on a merit badge there. And so you had all these scouts running around the Naval Academy, and I had the good fortune of being able to just kind of wander the halls of the Naval Academy um, as a young person and see what was going on. And one of the labs I just happened to walk into was the one where Bob Bermuda was. And I knew who Bob was because I knew what APRS was and I knew that he was famous and, and, uh, and then I just happened walking and I said, hi, I'm, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm Bob Bermuda and I'm working on building this CubeSat. And, you know, my jaw just kind of dropped open because I'd never actually seen like a real thing that was actually going to go to space before. So that was, that was a really special moment for me to, to uh, see that. And then after that, he said, I stayed with him a few minutes. He's like, you know, we're actually going to go talk to the ISS in a few minutes over amateur radio. And so he then brought me into another room where they had the station set up. And sure enough, the ISS pass came over. I got to listen to them talk. Um, the other scouts were there as well. And uh, one other memorable thing I remember is um, the astronaut, I think he was Army. And uh, we were at the Naval Academy, so they had some words going <laughs> back to us. So, but um, and that was my my first and uh, really um, my last real 
uh, interaction with Bob Inga. But, you know, I'll always remember that from being a very young amateur radio operator. I'll always have that memory of getting to meet him and having that very special experience. Coming up the chair. This is uh, a little of a, a side interaction with what went on. I did know Bob. I worked with him, talked to him several times, or and sometimes at the uh, symposiums and such. But uh, on the railroad in, in the early 2000s, when things were starting to crank up for what would become positive train control, the BNSF was working with what they called train management and dispatch system. And I remember when the boss got a bunch of us together to proudly proclaim about how we were going to be able to put GPS on the locomotives so that they could send their location in packets to our network to the back room. And I said, oh, I said, we, Hans has been doing that for about 20 years. And it just kind of burst his bubble <laughs> But, but I, I, I kind of wonder if somehow that you know, fact got to be part of what the spark for that idea was. And that is what has become PTC now, positive train control. kind of have a different perspective on Bob. Um, I'm like, in one way, I'm in awe of all the people who've worked with him at that level. I uh, went to the Naval Academy one time. I was actually working at the Naval Academy as a volunteer sailing instructor. And they have about 20, 40 foot sailboats over there. And I had uh, gotten a little bit interested in this APRS and actually ran into Bob over there unknowing who he really was. And uh, next thing you know, I ended up buying, uh, I remember talking to him about, well, should I buy the Kenwood or should I wait till uh, ICOM comes out with the system? And Bob goes, well, ICOM's not coming out with one anytime soon, so he might as well go ahead and get the D7. At any rate, uh, the next thing, you know, now I've got my D7, I understand how this stuff works, and Bob's got the satellites whipping around there, and I thought, hey, well, we'll put some, we'll put some uh, D7s on all the sailboats. Well, I just had to kind of mention that to Bob, and the next thing you know, I got about six D7s in my hand, yeah. and, and now I'm charged with getting those things installed and getting them up, up and running. And, and it was just, the, the amazing thing to me was I worked with this guy for about a year before I figured out who he really was. <laughs> so, Does a bike? Come on, Gary. Good. Yeah. This is a really, really quick short idea. Yeah. I don't really thought about much, but uh, my retirement, you know, I've been helping mentor a high school ham club, and one thing to do is fly balloons. And a few years ago, I got really tired of like having to measure every milligram that we flew. So I figured, why don't we do something similar to a balloon, where we don't have to worry about weight? How about a, a buoy? And I know just a guy to talk to about building ocean buoys. So I contacted Bob, the instructor in Naval Academy. He's obviously got to be an expert in this stuff. And he, I, 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 I kept giving him lots of questions, uh, probing his brain about all the different ways to design a buoy. It should be as deep as possible, put the weight here, and so forth. And then we built one, and it lasted about a week. And I went back to Bob and said, um, how many of these did you actually build? He says, well, the, the students put one together. I think it floated around under the dock for about a weekend. So, <laughs> I, uh, I discovered that Bob was a, was a great idea guy, but you did have to, uh, you know, just like probe his ideas to find out, Bob, how many times you've actually done this? Does this really work? You know, I, 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 I learned my lesson that way, but he was wonderful coming up with ideas, and uh, his, his enthusiasm was, his, was infectious. Thanks, Phil. Say last call. Anybody else? Lee and for TCW, neither an AMSAT nor a Tapper member, but a longtime APRS, or I think I started in the late 90s with APRS. And uh, Bob was great. I was uh, 
going up to D.C. to do some work with a friend of mine, uh, demoing some stuff to the, some government agencies, and I was in the Marine Corps Reserves. So I emailed Bob and said, hey, Bob, I'm going to be up in D.C. Can I pop by your office? So go there, go on base, like, yeah, come on in, showed me his lab. Uh, I think he showed me that satellite dish that people were talking about. And then uh, saw Bob at uh, DC's, DCC down in Orlando, I think, early 2000s. Uh, and then after a stint in Germany, I ended up in the DC area and ran into Bob at Hamfest and worked with him a couple of years on the Golden Packet, which some of you might know that very interesting experiment. And the first year that it passed, I think was, it worked, I think it was 2013. I was with uh, Bob at, uh, Governor Dick Hill observation post, and we had to haul the gear up le level by level by level, and Bob, as people know, being hyper, we're pulling this stuff up. Um, so yeah, Bob, great guy. Um, he will be missed. Anyone else still early? We can use it as All right. I want to, uh, I guess before we close out there, uh, to thank you all for coming to help us uh, celebrate Bob Bernina and his life. Uh, some great stories and great memories. He's going to be greatly missed. So uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you all the rest of this week at uh, weekend at Ham Mention. And uh, I'll obviously know by the Tampa booth especially. Uh, with that, thank you for coming. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.